I want to express my thanks. We've smashed past 30,000 subscribers on YouTube, so please do continue to subscribe and hit the like button. I massively appreciate it. A lot more content is coming your way. Um, today, I'm thrilled to be rejoined by a friend of the show who, when he came on, had elicited more of a reaction across all of our platforms than anyone we've had before. Uh, he's a global forecaster, someone whose predictions are frighteningly accurate, uh, and someone who, in this current world where we have a cost of living crisis uh, and obviously the ongoing war in Russia, he provides reason, he provides logic, and he can help us wade through some of the propaganda to elicit some of the truths. Uh, and that man, of course, is David Murrin. David, welcome again. I'm thrilled that you're uh, you're back on. And you, a bit like myself, you're getting over a bit of a sticky cough as well, aren't you? Yeah, I know. I've had it twice that she adds a lot of sympathy. It's a tenacious little sucker that requires a, a little bit longer to recover from. And occasionally you enter into coughing fits when really you wouldn't expect them. So I hope you're feeling better. But, uh, um, yeah, indeed. And for anyone who is watching and listening, uh, just because you have a cough, it doesn't mean it's COVID. So uh, uh, let's... actually, I have found myself wondering, this thing's so pernicious that actually maybe it is the eighth, ninth version of COVID that doesn't trigger a test, but it is because it's not like a cold. It's not like a winter process. I've seen great people around me. It really is very horrible. So, you know, maybe it is actually this sequential wave of moving to a common cold and it mutates and off we go. It's around the throat and the chest, given a chance. Anyway, just to show you that the gift of the Chinese keeps giving. It's the it's the Murrin variant. <laughs> well, the ads variant. Oh, could be, could be. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the response that I had across all the various platforms via email and comments, a general feedback when we had you on last time was... Um, Epic. That's probably the word that I would use. Um, almost unilaterally positive. Uh, you secretly have got a large army of uh, fans, and a lot of those expressed uh, joy and excitement um, that you were on again, and the topics that we covered, uh, where if anyone's unaware, we spoke about on a very high level how civilizations go through various epochs or eras, covering how they start and how they rise, get to a zenith, ultimately lead to a decline. We spoke about lateral and lineal thinking. Uh, we spoke a little bit about some of the methods and mechanics behind the forecasting. Uh, and it seemed to resonate with people. The topics that we covered, contemplating how and why, the reasons for that, seemed to strike a chord with people. Uh, and it left them wanting more. One of the sentiments that uh, seemed to come uh, from that feedback was understanding a little bit about what's going on now of course where we have this ongoing almost like cold war version two where we have russia and the west with china sort of umming and ahhing what they're going to do we have obviously the cost of living crisis which is ongoing although we're about to hit the summer now it's not too long before we hit another winter which of course means the pressure and the worry about fossil fuels and all that kind of thing and i think people are kind of wanting to try and relate a lot of what we talk about to what's going on now what does it mean understanding a little bit more about the predictions and how you forecast this what the power players um within this kind of situation who they are what they are why they are and kind of what can they do is there an end game in sight what's this all about and how's it gonna play out so there's a lot to cover potentially there but it does play back to what we what we set in our last conversation which is how societies and civilizations go through their periods and how thinking those two schools that we spoke about uh affect and how that might sort of affect the everyday man and woman today so just one little question then just one little question one little uh, right. question. so in, in listening to your plethora of um questions which are always engaging i found myself thinking so where can i start that sort of helps Listeners understand how the hell we got here. Give them a quick summary and then the practical process of what is probably coming next. And the first thing I'll start with is when people listen to me, some people with a more linear aspect complain that I'm pessimistic. I am innately optimistic. I'm innately optimistic on the basis that we're realistic, that we understand how we got here, the dynamics around us, so then we can navigate through them. Now, for those people living with rose-colored glasses, when you take them off, it's all a bit of a shock. And as I start to talk about this, it's not pleasant. 
the picture we're in is really unpleasant. It's been compounded by our collective delusion from our leaders through to the population that have accepted the version of events that it's all okay. So we're about to go and take the red pill or the green pill. That's really what it is. It's back to the matrix moment of which pill do you choose? And in this conversation, we're choosing the pill of reality. If you take the other pill, you're going to be boxed as a human battery, aka the matrix, or you're just going to be subject to what happens to us. And that I'm afraid doesn't look pretty. So let's just take this green pill and we'll work and navigate through this. The first, there are two big cycles which are imposing themselves upon us. One is that in the cycle of what I call the super Western Christian empire, a sequence of empires from the Portuguese to the Spanish to the Dutch, and then the French tried, and then Britain, Germany tried to challenge twice, and America, that is a sequence of Christian domains centered around Europe, because America was in fact a colony of Europe initially, before it became independent, and essentially their organizational process bonded not by their national mean, but by their religious mean. And if you look at it that way, Catholicism was the early stages, the civil war between Protestants and Catholics basically released thinking, the protesters or Protestants became freer in thought, and that belief system was associated with Holland and Britain, mainly because they were maritime powers, which derived from coastline, which had a high ratio versus internal volume, because people that are maritime are lateral. People that live in land, land large land masses are linear. So there, this protester movement, this maritime movement, which was all about meritocracy, first in, in, in Holland and Britain, and then the melding at the time of William of Orange and Mary, essentially brought together the Protestant powers against the Catholic powers. And the net result was the greatest empire in the world, Britain, and it was a sea power, a group of you know, relatively few millions controlling the world through the sea lanes. And America really can be viewed as the bigger version of that because it had many more people in its island, I like a continent, but it controlled the world through sea lane power as Mannheim observed, essentially emulating British power. And the failures of Germany were the failures behind resourcing as a continental power versus a global maritime power. And you could never compete. This wasn't going to happen. So we're now at the end of the American cycle. Literally, they went into the fifth stage of decline after 9-11, and we have had 20 years of accelerated decline through a sequence of moments. And part of that process was to print money to compensate for lack of growth. Printing of money created stability, and stability created apparent predictability. Now, one of the things that we talked about before, which again is important, is systems are built by the domination of lateral thought from the first point onwards of first stage, second stage interface, which is a civil war. Wars are all about bringing lateral forces to the rise because the only way you win a war is with lateral thought that outthinks the enemy and out adapts them. Any linear system doesn't last very long in sustained combat. So civil wars are about lateralization and the expansion from the beginning of that civil war of regionalization just takes the world by surprise if the conditions are met. Somewhere at the top though, when the system reaches the extent of its expansion, there is another civil war, sometimes quiet, as it was in the middle of the Victorian era, where the linear thinkers start to push out the maverick thinkers, because after all, you built these institutions, the empire just is so huge with its momentum, and who needs adaptation because I have size, I have momentum. So one by one, these organizations of, of, of civil control, whether it's the government or wherever aspects of it become bigger and bigger, politics becomes to play rather than individuality, and the lateral people get spat out the back until you start to go into overextension. No one even noticed that because essentially, you look just as big as you were. It's just quietly your productivity starts to drop and you can't really afford your system. So you start to rely on debt. And by the period of overextension decline, you are printing money like nobody's business. One of the byproducts of printing is linearization because now you've artificially maintained momentum of your economy by taking smaller and smaller portions of real creative growth in the system and using financial leverage to compensate. That is exactly why the Western world right now has huge amounts of debt sitting on its balance sheets, because in effect, it has lost productivity. And when I started explaining this to 20 years ago and said, China will become more productive and more creative than America, who used to fall off their chairs because they couldn't understand that a communist system could beat a capitalist system. It's not about the system. It's about the energy of the people. And they find a way 
and now more patents per year are registered in China than they are America. It's very clear. Now, China has borrowed money, but it's borrowed it from itself. So basically, you have more control over it, whereas America's borrowed it from everyone else. You have less control over it. And at the same time, its dollarized economy is about to shrink in half because the Chinese are building an alternative block. You're properly looking at late stage hegemonic challenge by the Chinese. Their economy is probably more powerful than the Americans in many ways on a purchasing power parity. That's the cost of a hamburger in each country dynamic or the cost of a Mars bar. So basically we're right at this moment of hegemonic challenge and the decider between the swap. Now there's another cycle, which is really fascinating. It's a, a thing called a Kondratiev cycle. It was observed by an economist who argued that inflation had a 56 year cycle and at the peak of that cycle, there was a war of some kind. The wars go back from the Cold War paradigm and the lockup in 75, he was long dead by then. Goes back to the First World War, goes back to basically the Napoleonic War and it goes, so, so you've got this sequence of 56 years and the American Civil War in between that. But that wasn't a global war, that was a local war. And I say it because what really happens is the friction between elements rise the price of commodities, inflation increases, and you end up with an inflation and war spike. Now, I have come to reframe that. And that is that human systems create social organization so that basically they can push back the entropy of the universe in anti-entropy activity. And the more coherent they are, the bigger they are, the more effective they are. But we've got the survival system where when they become old and decrepit, a new system rises up and we use the war to knock them off their perch and the peak is higher for the next system and the next system. All our genes care about is we have more control over our environment. We're using wars to remove weak systems and replace them with stronger systems because they're lateral and more adaptive in a conflict situation. So the first biggie here is, I'm sorry, guys, if you'd like to be liberal and think war's you know, out of history, war is intrinsically wrapped up in our human evolution until we consciously find another route to evolve without killing each other. And so far, we're not even aware we do it. So that's unlikely. So in this process, imagine what I call a cycle of anti-entropic behavior. It's like a heartbeat every 56 years that creates chaos and reorders the empires and systems so they have to challenge and fight. And if one's ready to go, they go into this big heartbeat pump and we're in it right now. And I'm sad to say, that the peak is away yet. It's 25 to 27. So whatever's happening to us is not the end of something, it's the acceleration of a process. And within that context, I've been consistently predicting that inflation is going to go through the roof. Inflation is driven by a number of dynamics. One of them is essentially demand dynamics. Traditionally, we think about that causing inflation, but the other is a constriction of supply. And the conflict that we face, as we already saw from the sur surge in energy with Russia, is about constriction. And so there's much more of that to come. And on top of that, the embedded inflation versus negative growth in many ways, real negative growth over almost a decade and a half, was caught up with the population saying, I can't live on this. So now you've got embedded wage inflation, which is becoming and will keep coming ingrained. So the first point for you to take away is inflation isn't going to go away. Don't believe the central bank and don't believe Sunak when he makes ridiculous promises. He's going to tame something he has no control over. He's got more egg on his face and is about to be splattered in eggs as this goes wrong in front of him. Governments can't stop inflation. Inflation is way bigger than any single government. It's a collective process that's massive. And that's the first thing. You can try and optimize yourself within the inflationary boundaries and I'm afraid Britain hasn't done a good job with that, thanks to this ridiculous orthodoxy from the Treasury enacted by Hunt and Sunak. But essentially, the general wave of it, I'm afraid we can't avoid. All we can do is, like a storm on, on a boat, navigate through it. So inflation is one part of this cycle, and war is another. And essentially, wars come about at this type of war because the hegemon, which is America, is weak. And it's been getting weaker and weaker under our eyes. And the first thing it really did was it elected Biden. And the Biden being a weak geriatric you know, image of a president who's now completely demented. And we have to ask the question, who really is control of the White House? Because it's not Biden. And I, it's a very big question for the first time ever. 
the president is not in control of the administration. Who is? And that is a big question. And the 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 red flag for China and Russia was essentially this ridiculous withdrawal from Afghanistan that was precipitously responsible, saving only $4 billion a year, by the way, to maintain the effort. He decided to literally cause a rout, reverse the whole country, and signal to China and Russia that the weakness was they always knew was there, it was right here at this moment. Add into that the revolution in hypersonic weapons, which people are just beginning to become aware of in Russia. And the Kinzhal missile, which is a Russian intermediate hypersonic weapon, if you get it up on a MiG-31, you fly to 70,000 feet, you like get to Mark 2.8 and you launch the thing, it kind of gets up to Mark 5 and then slows down near the target and its warhead you know, navigates its way. That is not the real deal, right? That's an intermediate hypersonic system. And it's good news that the Patriots now can knock them down. They will just swap technology that essentially came out of naval technology and updated the Patriots to do it. So it's no big leap. The real hypersonic threat are things that come in at you and they maneuver at Mark 10 and we have no answer to them. And the Chinese have built their whole military challenge around 1,200 upwards ballistic weapon systems with hypersonic glide weapons, more of them, that can kill carriers and destroy American and Japanese power in the Asian basin. And they have built it on the predication they will use it by surprise. There's a big piece in the Murray Nations I've done on why she will enact World War III or the next stage of it with a Pearl Harbor type event that's way bigger. Because it's the only way they can get to controlling the region. Because if they go for a blockade of Taiwan, the Japanese will weigh in. And if the Japanese weigh in, the Americans are forced in. And now the Chinese involved with a two to one naval struggle, maybe more if you release the Atlantic assets, and it's much harder to win. So they've come to the same conclusion as the Japanese, like an overwhelmingly powerful initial strike will buy them time. Unlike the Japanese, they have the industrial power to beat the West because they'll have between 60 and 80 percent of the world's industrial power wrapped up in the second island chain when they absorb it. It's almost impossible for the rest of the world to take them on. And certainly they won't be, once they consolidate that, is my thesis, they will come out of it after they built a huge Navy. It may take them five years to do that, but they are coming for us. And this cycle is the trigger for it. Now, going back to where Russia is, I can't help thinking that Putin really was a, probably a bit stabbed in the back by Xi. I think Putin thought the Chinese were going to move when he moved. And she, being somewhat cunning, basically backed away from it as it looked like it wasn't going according to schedule and took a pause. And um, <clears throat> since day five, as we've been seeing, I've written almost 50 updates for the unfolding of this conflict. And they've all been two months ahead, really, of what's happened, because there are some very predictable patterns in this conflict that replicate the First World War from 1980 onwards, which I wrote a book about, and the other dynamics which we can talk about. So what to expect next? The Ukrainians are facing an army which is unable to maneuver its armored formations, it doesn't have any, unable to coordinate them with its air force, and has a fragile, rigid defense line and a soft sector behind it. All the Russians can do is essentially put their tactical air forces close by and hope the anti-aircraft defenses aren't strong enough and lob glide bombs as the armored formations come in. And if the Americans or provide enough patriots, and you've got to assume there's more than two in country right now, which seem to be pinned down around Kiev, then the Russians are going to get a horrible shock as these large envelopes of air control literally protect the armored formations and literally it'll gut the Russians. So we can assume that when that massive artillery barrage comes that destroys Russian artillery and deep seated logistics, it, it'll happen from nowhere. And the Ukrainians have met the condition of essentially, we know with 100% transparency and vision over the battlefield, thanks to NATO intelligence assets, all our conditions are met and we're off. And I think we basically have to assume that if there's a surprise, the surprise is the collapse of the Russian army. His psychological state is not dissimilar, I would argue, to 1917, not dissimilar to the, the German army in 1918, before the Battle of Amiens, which had been gutted of all its fighting capability, which didn't we didn't realise it until we pushed. And very similar to the French army, which was the best army in the world, apparently, 
much better off on a relative basis than the, than the Russians, who depended on the Maginot line and fixed, slow, sluggish defences and were completely caught napping by a German blitzkrieg that got around the back of them. So I can't see anything good that happens. And I think the surprise may be for the Russians, that is, for the Ukrainians, it's great for the West. But for the Russians, it's really very dire. And I would be surprised if there wasn't some kind of revolution. I mean, the, the chances are there is some kind of mechanism that goes with that. Okay, so that was an awful lot to take in as part of an overview of where we sort of come from to get to here and sort of what's happening in this state of flux that we're in sort of now. So if we try and break that down. So for the past 60 or 70 years, I think it's fair to say that America has been the global superpower since the end of World War II, especially when Europe was on its knees. We're now in this period for the last 20 years, almost quarter of a century, where America is in that state of decline. So it's probably worth spending just a minute or two to explain how has America arrived there and how was it unable, perhaps it didn't even recognise that this was going on. You hit a really good point, which has much greater connotations, which is because you see it in South American countries all the time. Greece did it as well. If you just print money willy-nilly, the value of your currency relatively is decimated. The, the value of your raw goods, ultimately what it's linked to, which is raw bullion, is completely diminished. And now we're in this weird status quo, change, I should say, where oil, for example, which was historically measured against the dollar, which eventually has a measurement against some form of bullion, they're now looking to potentially move away. You were talking about this new block as to how do we uh, globally price the barrel, perhaps we move away from the dollar system. You also touched on inflation, and you can't talk about inflation, especially when the Western Hemisphere is concerned, because we are all interconnected. Everything drives everything. No one economy serves everyone. You've got services, manufacturing and production, you've got the raw material, you've got the labour, you've got everything. We are all ultimately entrenched with everyone else, and you're absolutely right to say inflation is not one thing that one entity to, can cure perhaps probably worth breaking through some of the uh propaganda that rishi is trying to ride this wave of at the moment recently for anyone who's uh watching or listening now inflation in the uk which for a little while has been sat above 10 percent, has now for the first time fallen below 10 percent. which of course rishi's trying to blow his trumpet over as a sign that what he said was true it's a sign that his uh, sort of mini manifesto that he sort of, the, the drum that he was banging, which got him in into power is working. But of course, as you've alluded to, he's one person in one entity of a multi-connected entity. So it's a much bigger thing. And he's obviously not letting on the, the truth there. You mentioned also as part of the decline of America, and it kind of goes on to mine and several other people's lines of thinking. It's a really good question. Who ultimately is in control? So we're talking about leaders. You mentioned Biden and who is leading the White House. I've always been of a firm opinion that whoever you've got as the uh, the eye candy or the representative of a particular administration, doesn't matter who it is, where it is, isn't necessarily the real person who's ultimately calling the shots or, or holding the money bags. And I would argue there's a certain degree of truth in that where, wherever you go, but certainly in America now. Even more so in Britain today, I would argue. Uh, uh, agreed, totally agreed. And it's also interesting that you refer to the war because we still don't know, and I know a lot of Russian people, both who remain in Russia and have fled, who can't understand the motives, the true motives for the actual war itself. We know that there's always a game of chess between, say, the Russia, the Russians and the Americans, and especially now Chinese and Americans, where... You look to make gains if you sense weakness in the other in the other side, but the sort of the smoke screen, if you like, excuse that he's used about the the breaking of the treaty, about the expansion of NATO, about wanting to bring Ukraine back into the family, doesn't seem to wash. Uh, what is his true objective in regards to Ukraine, and what is the wider connotation for his war? And ultimately, you were you obviously you're referring about inflation. We're painting a realistic, albeit stark, picture when it comes to ultimately supply and demand uh, of resources, of what we need to survive, which is obviously the ability to heat our home, pay for water, feed our children, and so on and so forth. And then China, 
in all of this. So, of course, a lot of people would say that COVID was a, a smear campaign against China to try and slow down what seems to be an inevitable growth. There is an anti-Chinese sentiment at the moment in terms of ground level. Does that potentially have an impact in their ability to become the next power? And if so, or if not, what does the next five to ten years as we get to that, that trough and start to rise again, that end of that 56 year period, what does our medium term future look like, I suppose? So which question would you like me to answer? What is your name? <laughs> no, uh, let, let's, <laughs> let, let's go back to America. Let's go back to I can, a... I can answer one question at a time, Ed. <laughs> do a sequence, but one at a time. Let's go back to America. So America has ridden high for a, a half century, but for the last 20, 25 years, they're on a state of decline. What, what events, or, or either be it groundbreaking sliding doors moment or, or cumulative or, or ha happening in parallel, sort of started this decline? So, so I would argue the critical moment was 9-11. 9-11 took place because the CIA wouldn't share information with the FBI. Two agencies competing, and up until then for the previous decade, they've fended off every attack or plan against them because they followed the lines of working jointly together and they did a great job, but they failed because they were in competition. And in competition and fracture is one of the hallmarks of decline. So what did 9-11 do? It sent America off in a war dance against fundamental Islam. <clears throat> and understandably, there had to be some retribution. Um, there had to be some payback and there was an ongoing threat that needed to be responded to. But it needed to be measured as in, and not all consuming. So for the next decade, basically America hunted fought in Afghanistan, Iraq, in a war that never suited them, in a war you could argue in some ways that they propagated by their behavior. They lost their moral imperative by torturing and rendition. And the moral imperative is the architecture where unconsciously people believe they have the right to be the hegemony, the right to rule over other people through moral superiority. And thanks to Rumfeld and Cheney, that was lost with rendition and torture, just like that. So that's the first key step. We then kind of go through 9-11 and, the, and the, the money printing of money started then because, of course, strategically you have to face the threat that this represented economically. That process, if you did it three times for the bottom of 03, by the time we came to our first financial glitch, which was 07 to 08, which sent shudders through the system, you were leveraged eight to ten times to solve the problem. And now, in the meantime, the Chinese had decided quite correctly that they couldn't directly confront America's power. So from the third Taiwan Straits on, crisis onwards, they came up with a super cunning plan. And believe me, this is they did create this plan. We're going to entice the Western people to invest in our country where inflation is, where basically labor's low. It'll keep their inflation down so they can't resist. They made lots of money. We're going to get them to invest in the biggest manufacturing process the world's ever seen. We're going to de-industrialize everyone else as a result of it. And we're going to steal all the IP that comes to us because, of course, we see every part of it. And the stuff we can't get from our manufacturing base, by the way, we're going to basically steal the 200,000 high IQ Chinese whose job from 2000 onwards was to steal everything that moved that wasn't bolted down. And there was America thinking that the time of liberal great money making was afoot and they were using another emerging market country to fuel that process. And the reason why inflation didn't take off when it should have done from 2000 onwards is because of that Chinese involvement and that low cost labor and production. Now, over that 10 years, China did something else. It laid the foundations of a growing military power. By 2014, the moment it went and started colonizing those islands that were basically below the high water mark, Everyone should have gone ding, 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 ding. This isn't working where the capitalists are becoming more democratic. This isn't working where they're coming closer to us. They're now actually militarily expanding to create chains of defense, which you only do if you have an aggressive intent. But we missed all of that. And that's where the pivot to Asia came, slowly, belatedly with Obama. But again, every single corporate in the States had their fingers in the till. Okay, so... <laughs> 
a lot to take in there. There's been a lot of narrative and a lot of, um, especially when there's so many videos doing the rounds where Americans, Rumsfeld at, at one stage, I'm sure, admitted that money went missing, especially from the Pentagon. There was, and you know, the, co the cost of these wars was so coincidentally the same value. What I'm picking up from this is irrespective of the motive, and of course we can talk about oil and controlling supply and all the rest of it, it comes back to, like you just said, a line of thinking, a complacency and an arrogance, which almost screams unjustly superiority over everyone else. Well, it's called hubris. It's what happens in decline, where the empire believes it's all-powerful, can squander what resources it has thinking they're limitless, as indeed Putin has done with his, the lives of his own people, thinking that he's the Soviet Union in 1944, which he's not demographically. America did something very similar. It didn't believe China could ever equal it because they were communists. They weren't the same as, and they were inferior. Uh, basically, that these sort of Islamic people were a threat everywhere, which they represented because they were on the rise, but they had been subjugated in different ways, and we hadn't conducted ourselves in a way, I would say, that minimized their their animosity towards us, so that things were made worse. The Bathurst Party, in the way it was treated after the invasion of Iraq, was stupid. They were your highly trained administrators and military people, and they were ostracized. What else would they do with their spare time but turn against their invaders? I mean, you know, you don't have to be brain in Britain to see that there are various options when you go into a country. And one of them is working out who could be the basis of your insurgency and somehow encourage them to do something else. But the Americans cornered them right into oh, no other jobs being insurgent. And they were good at it. And it murdered us. It sapped our country dry. It took life. But most importantly, all our spending became focused on asymmetric warfare. So the Navy, to be relevant in America, had to somehow come up with an agenda of littorial combat because all of the combat with obviously these asymmetric insurgents was on the littorial domain. The idea of deep sea power and maintaining the sea lanes, well, they just forgot about that because they wouldn't get the budget for it. So the whole armed force structure moved towards this low technology enemy. And the result is this high technology enemy rose up underneath them in the form of China. And that was going to be my next point. So what you have is a duality at China, somebody who's rising to technological and operational superiority, because it's all wonderful having the great tech and having the numbers, but you've got to strategize and utilize that more intelligently than what you're coming up against. But as you hit the nail on the head, the reason why inflation wasn't a, uh, an issue sooner is because of the duality on the other side, which was China's aggressive, let's be the production facility for the world with untouchable labor and production costs, which allows the demand to go through the roof, the supply to be ample, and effectively fixing the price in the market. Well, lower, keep, keeping inflation absolutely flat, which also then let the Western world print money because there were no direct inflationary consequences through money printing because China was a production basket for them. Now, this whole process reminds me of prior to 1914, when the entwining of the German economy with Europe was so tight that people didn't believe conflict could ever happen. So the liberals in the West thought, well, the more capitalists we make them, the more they're going to be like us, the more they're going to overturn you know, the, the whole autocratic system, and the world's going to be lovely. I'm going to make lots of money in the process. Those people, past 2014, I would argue, do fit in the category of traitorous behavior. They have sold their children, their country, their lifestyle for their own wallets when the evidence was really clear that something was very wrong. If you move to that same question in 16, 17, 18, look at the look before that, the Cameron, the Cameron Osborne golden era. I mean, talk about Muppets. Those guys should put their hands and head together in disgust because the evidence of what they were doing to the Ouija's wasn't just saying, oh, we don't like you. They were building concentration camps. They were conditioning them. They were doing everything that Nazi Germany did in a more sophisticated way. And yet our leaders decided it was the golden era with China. We've been led by liberally blind people whose greed to fill the pockets, whether it's a politician who wanted an economy to work to be reelected or the corporates within it, they've been blinded by it. And in 2017, I went to a big dinner welcoming an envoy of Chinese people and, and a trade envoy. There were about 80 people, black tie, and, you know, all the usual kowtowing. 
And I stood up and I took a really deep breath. And I said, look, it's a great privilege to be here with you. And I studied Chinese history and your martial arts for nearly 30 years. So I love your ancient culture and its roots. But you and I are aware that the Communist Party is very divergent from those roots in many ways. And I'm also aware that you seek to ensure that the activity of trade is designed to undermine us. And for all of you that essentially sit there and want to do business, you are undermining the future of your children, your country, and you are betraying the very values of democracy. Can you imagine you could have heard a pin drop? And everyone after said, how did you do that? Because I had to, because I had to speak out. And at the time people said, well, you're not gonna make it home. And you know, there was a real sense that you had crossed a line in a public place and confronted what they were. And of course, you can imagine my site's inundated with various Russian and Chinese agencies who like to kind of deframe. And But that was the beginning. That was when beyond that. So I have, when I listen to advocates for China who manage their money in America, there's a very big one who should be nameless, who has a very similar theory to mine, having received my book before he wrote it. Um, and essentially, there was always a question I had when breaking the code of history was about warning everyone about the inevitable conflict China would bring upon us in its hegemonic challenge by 2025, that somehow they'd find a way back. So he is exactly the opposite. His argument is essentially China will win, there's nothing we can do. But let me tell you, if China wins, our whole society, China doesn't just have a concept of, I'd like space out of the third island chain. China has a concept of the eradication of all freedom and democracy in the world. It's built software and technology against the Uyghurs, the Hong Kong Chinese, and its own population that removes any individual who shows any individual thought. And your phone will betray you with AI and apps on it. It is the most terrifying prospect that every dictator in history would have loved to deploy. And they have that technology. So they seek the eradication of what they call the virus of freedom. And right now we don't have a choice. They are actually about to wage war on us. There's nothing we can do because we've been asleep. And it's now a question of the moment when they strike. And what are we? What can we do? Wake up. And when people say, that's terrifying, can I put my head in the sand? No, wake up, realize this is now. We No one accepted that Russia was going to invade. And I gave warning six months beforehand, it was obvious they're going to invade. This is no different. And the reason why most people find it hard is most people sit in a spectrum of normality. They don't like confrontation. They don't like aggression and they will avoid it because it's wasteful and it doesn't suit them. But this other subset of humanity that becomes dictators are predators. They don't live that way. They've lived their whole life by aggression, challenge, confrontation and destruction. And most people in the normal bracket have no idea how the other people work. But let me give you a clue. If you've read Mein Kampf, it said what Hitler was going to do. If you listen to Putin, he did what he said he was going to do. And if you listen to Xi, he's about to wage war on everyone. He said it. So why can't we believe it when the dictator who has total power says what he's going to do? It's because we don't understand people who don't think like us, but we need to. Because our first line of defense is to see the threat, is to call it out to our friends, to call it out to politicians and go and say, why have you not spent money on defense? Why have you left us exposed when you can see we're at war via NATO with Russia over Ukraine? Because as we talked about before, this isn't Ukraine versus Russia. NATO is thoroughly entwined in the interaction and control of that conflict, whether it's the weapon systems, the training mechanisms, and the real-time intelligence. So we're involved in that process, but somehow we don't spend money on defense. And I think it's because some clever clogs in Sunak's department and the MOD think, aren't we smart? We'll give these weapons to the Ukrainians and we'll win a war against Russia without spending any money on defense. Isn't that the cheapest, best way to go? Well, I'm here to say that it isn't just about Russia. It's about China, much bigger systematic threat. <clears throat> and although Truss isn't perhaps the dry, br brightest politician in the book, she has got it right with, you need to grow to escape inflation. You need to get rid of the orthodoxy of the civil service and especially the treasury. And China is the greatest threat we face. And what you're doing with Russia is you're engaging with China in your actions of defeating Russia. But it's part of a much bigger consistent strategy. So going back to your original question about what should people do, 
I'm afraid inflation is now endemic. So be prepared for it to get worse. So if you think that borrowing short term, don't like lock in your loans, make sure you take what you can get because it's going to get worse. And if you go to Turkey, they live in a 90% official inflation level, probably 150 unofficially, and they find way to survive. So if they do, we can and we will, but we're going to have to adapt to it. But we are going to have to start demanding of our politicians to defend us. And, the, and we all remember the Battle of Britain. And we all probably know that Fighter Command orchestrated that. And, and Fighter, Fighter Command's history is bizarre because the air ministry believed in bombers. And Trenchard started on April the 1st, 1918, the RAF that merged the arms of the Navy and Army Air Force, the Royal Flying Corps, the Royal Naval um, uh, Auxiliary Service, put them together to create the RAF. And he was mindful or he didn't want them to get soon back in the army. So he had to make strategic bombing the differentiator. So they created this idea that bomber always gets through. And by sort of 36, 37, if you spoke to the air ministry, you can't defend against it. The only thing you can do is have more of them and you wreak equal havoc on the other side in an earlier version of deterrence and nuclear weapons. But when the public found out, they said, you've got to defend us. And through public opinion, fighter command came into being. And we know that when they put you doubting in command and two lateral people, Park as a second in command, they adapted and created the best air defense systems the world has seen. And we survived the Battle of Britain. I think that is the perfect model for public pressure to be placed upon our government. And everyone has a voice. So you, if you feel this is slightly true, you've got to start shouting out in public to your friends, to your politicians, we should be spending 10% of GDP in defense. And when they say to you, we can't afford to, in the First World War and Second World War, when deterrence had failed, we were spending 60% a year of our GDP. The whole economy became a war machine. So in comparison to that and the loss of life, even 10% is cheaper. Very true. And if you want to kind of get more snippets of that and trade opinions with like-minded people, I urge you to check out David's Murrah Nations, where you have opinion pieces, news, further forecasts, um, and a little bit more detail on some of the subjects that we we cover today, um, we, exactly in that vein. Uh, you you re you you referenced a lot of uh, items there, which I do concur with. Um, in in the short term, obviously, inflation, therefore, things like cost of borrowing is going to go up. So what we need to do is be prepared, uh, embrace ourselves to be a little bit more resilient, uh, because the, the the tough times that we've experienced over the last couple of winters are unfortunately going to continue. the The curious nature in all of this is. Um, and I actually remember my grandfather as far back as the very early 90s telling me that China was going to be the next superpower militarily, commercially, and everything, really. It's not a surprise probably for most people to hear that they do have this, this agenda militarily, not too dissimilar to Britain in the past or America in the past. Uh, but Russia in all of this. Now, we know that there is a, a Russia-America game of chess, which pretty much is happening all the time. What do we know about the true extent of the relationship or coalition or whatever you want to call it between Russia and China? And what exactly is Russia's game in all of this? We know that China potentially are going to be the big threat, the big superpower to take over from America. But what, what's Russia trying to gain out of this? Are they just trying to follow them on the coattails okay, coat so, or, or what? So let's look at Russia and then the coalition with China and do them as two separate things. So Russia has the worst demographics in the world anywhere, right? So if you looked at its cycle of empire, it's like in legacy, sitting out the back, just languishing. And along came Mr. Putin in 2000. And at that stage, no one could envisage that Russia's economy could survive without joining the EU because the commodity cycle was at one of the bottoms of its cycle. So you couldn't gain from the revenues from the commodity resourcing that always made Russia's economies work. So his view was join the EU. And that's where you'll see the membership applications and you know the whole conversation. Even join NATO, join anything that helped me get out of this mess. They were rejected, which I think actually was foolish at that stage because it could have been a way of entwining them and integrating them in a way that all of this could have been involved. And I think that as victors, 
I dare say the West, but especially America, was arrogant and didn't recognize that Russia was a great empire and deserved respect, whatever had happened to it, to effectively integrate it. And at the same time, parallel to that, which is a piece which I think isn't talked about, there's a reverse takeover where East Germany took over West Germany, not the other way around. And the Stasi embedded people and politicians that basically started to change Germany from this capitalist system to East Germany in a morph. No, we a, didn't see, we those, didn't see the, any of those Sorry, things. just two really, really important points there. Um, it sounds like we missed a trick, that Russia was weak as Putin was in his infancy, and we could have potentially negotiated, even if it was a transition or a multi-phase joining into the EU, where they would have been aligned with us rather than against so, us. And, and then basically you would have been able to surround China from the beginning. The thing that I find amazing is that Russia still had this massive ICBM system. So you're sitting there thinking, mm -hmm. well, they may be inert, but they're not really inert because they've got the second biggest strategic nuclear capability. Mm. And I want to actually bring them in and neuter them for good. So why not integrate them in the EU when they want to be, rather than stick them on the other side? But then you raise a very good point. So ignoring America for one second, and let's look insular within Europe. Well, well, before you do, let me add just one quick thing. I think the American military institution panicked at that stage because if they didn't have Russia, they didn't have an enemy. Because they didn't really have the Islamic threat mm. to justify their continuation. And so by bringing Russia in, the old enemy, what would they have done to justify the continued military existence? Well, very good point. And that was something I was going to come to in a second. But going into Europe for one moment, history's narrative would make you think that West Germany, as you said, <clears throat> successfully and triumphantly re-engulfed East Germany, the reunification of Germany, take two. Actually, it's a reverse look, takeover. look at the stupidity of how they aligned the marks one to one, how the eco economic collapse of East Germany brought West Germany almost to its knees, the stupidity economically and politically of what they did there. Uh, so actually, the narrative is a mirror, really, mirror reverse of what happens. So, so I would say the knees issue comes about because Germany was the youngest of the European systems. And let's just say it came into being before 1870 in the official domain yep. and somewhere around 1866 when it fought the Austrians yep. and all the Prussian states melded together. So the reason why, you know, it started World War I was because after the Prussian Anglo, the, the Prussian Franco War was because it was expanding and vibrant and they wanted to challenge for hegemony. So the thing that's very interesting is that it lost a lot of people in World War I, but then 8 million more people by the time it started World War II because they bred like bunnies. The French never made up the numbers and we in Britain just about crawled over the game line. Of so course. it's a very good example of, 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 the, of demographics driving the system. And just to finish this before you ask, is what it meant was even after World War II, this system was still relatively young. So it went through the Cold War and it was like the one system that was going upwards when all the other systems around were going down, which is why it became the engine for the EU. Correct. And, and By the time it absorbed East Germany, it was actually on the down. So it used the last of its energy to absorb East Germany and was like massive indigestion because it was you know, 28, 24 million of, of retrograde people that had to be brought up to the same standard. And it practically choked on it as a result. Anyone would have done. It was a huge feat. But it almost burnt off the last of its national energy. And then after that, it became much more moribund and it went into decline. And its politicians were subverted by the Stasi from Schroeder. Merkel, I'm convinced, was Schroeder too. Because every policy she made underlined Germany and the EU, if you look at them. If you were randomly bad news, you get 50-50. She got them all. And then if you go and look at good old Olaf, who's finally turned around to give weapons to Ukraine, now he knows the outcome. He's finally worked out he's on the wrong side of the fence. And it's all going to go horribly wrong. So you can have four, three million, three million bucks of weapons because aren't we Germans nice? Even though we send you helmets at the beginning. So... The <laughs> So that's the answer to the question there that I think kind of... So in this construct, why did Putin go? He went because he was rejected and he went because up until 08, oil started going up again. Oil revenues increased and he turned around and said, I don't need the EU because I'm now a commodity producer. And the commodity cycle started. He looked like a, an economic miracle maker. He just rode a wave. And then he became more aggressive. 
Then into the peak of 10, when it collapsed, he probably thought, oh, I wonder if I'd gone early with my aggression. And then it surged upwards and it sat on a plateau around 120. And that period of three years would have filled the Russian coffers. And if you look at the initiation of the new weapon systems that you see from state of six you know, drone torpedoes to Satan ICBMs to the Kinzel missile, all the things that were the wonder weapons, they originated with that capital, which came from the cycle of oil and gas. He didn't view gas as a main revenue maker. He viewed gas as a weapon because at that stage it was flatlining at three, it does three bucks. So he saw that as the next mechanism to start to subvert Germany and other countries. And by then, he was implacably heading towards, I want to challenge and rebuild the Russian Empire. Now, what's different is it wasn't the national energy of Russia. It was one man's ambition fed by a commodity oriented society that was in a commodity wave, which is exactly where you see the failures. Because when you end up in decline, the, the net system has no national energy to adapt. So the thing becomes fragile, unproductive, things don't work. And the uh, Russian army is a large body of people representative of a proportion of Russia. So you can't escape from that social paradigm. And that's what we've seen. We've seen a system which is broken. And one of the valid points for the Ukrainians, although this is a brutal thing to say, is killing Russians who are part of a demographically contracting system makes it very sensitive. You can get away with killing lots of Russians in the Second World War. And because they were literally expanding massively, they could induct a million men a month and you never saw it. But Putin's made the mistake of thinking the concept behind Russia today and the USSR are the same, but the demographics between the two to find a very different social system. And so he has been completely careless with the lives of his people. And those lives of the people are part of the social system which now sits underneath him and really could change. So... That explains to me why Putin mounted the aggressive act. He went to the point of aggression because Biden was on the other side. And I think we have to assume that his conversations with Xi encouraged him that if he went, he would be fully supported by the Chinese. And I think somewhere behind the back of it, I suspect he was stabbed in the back by the Chinese with their own agenda. And they've really, they've really kind of let him out there. And they've also made another decision because... The key part of that alliance, which you asked about, is the Chinese are thoroughly dependent on the Russians for their plans for expansion. <clears throat> Let's just say their Pearl Harbor version two, Red Lightning, as I call it, the, the name of my book, works. And in 20 minutes, they launch this massive missiles range, destroys seven key naval and air bases the, the, the Americans have. The Japanese air bases go, three carrier groups disappear, two MU groups disappear, every warship in the second island chain no longer exists and America can't get back in. The trouble is China can't control the sea lanes beyond the second island chain. So how does it survive for its resourcing? It needs overland supplies from Russia because the US Navy can't get to them and it needs those supplies to build the second phase of its military expansion. So Russia is an integral part of the ambition of China. It also needs something else. It needs the ICBMs that the Russians have that mean the alliance between Russia and China's ICBMs are enough to withstand an American assault. Because most recently, the Chinese didn't have enough ICBMs because they've been building intermediate missiles to kill carriers and warships and not arm them with nuclear weapons. Now, they've made more of them. They've built more silos in the ground and they've gone from 350 to reports are 450. But whether any missiles in the silos is another issue. But net-net, they can't afford to see Russia's anti-Western stance collapse in, you know, and move to a Navani position. So they must be making the assumption, because they're not stupid, that Russia is vulnerable. But when Putin goes, he'll, they will be raised by someone else who's equally as pro-Chinese and anti-Western. If they thought he would go and there would be a revolution against the old regime, they would have given Russia every weapon system they needed. That's interesting. So just bringing it back just a couple of phases. So what we have is, to a certain extent, the hurt pride of effectively a dictator. A lost empire. Yeah, a lost empire. And somebody who took uh, the lack of an invitation to the gang as a personal slight. Absolutely. But at the, by the same token, and I agree with your sentiment about always needing um an enemy 
And that's the reason why I think a lot of these wars are self-purporting and are maintained and sustained for as long as possible. I do not believe that wars are ended as quickly and efficiently as they possibly can be because the war effort is actually good for business. Well, it depends what sort of war you're talking about. Well, in this context, in this because context. For Ukraine, where its survival depends on it, bet your bottom dollar, they'll do anything they can to end it. But if you're involved in an expeditionary war where your homeland is intact, that has different dynamics. That's true. However, the Ukrainian war, which I hate calling it the Ukrainian war, is not a war instigated or purported by them. So they, that, that, so the, I would, I would use this terminology. This is an invasion more than anything. I call, I call it the battle for Ukraine. Yeah, it, it, that's a more apt term. That's a more apt term. The interesting thing, then, apart from a big metaphoric fu to the West, um, and I agree with you about weaponizing any resource you possibly can. You know, we we've seen it with those uh, gas supplies, um, and whether or not they were, uh, how can I put it, to, uh, vandalized, shall we say? Uh, those gas lines into Germany, he has metaphorically a a hand around the throat of Europe in the sense that it's so reliant on Russian gas. Apart from becoming extremely rich uh, and influential, um, and look, it can't hurt if he gains ter territory, uh, he doesn't have the same aggressive plans in the way that China does. What's Putin's end game? Well, well, well actually, I, I think not. I think that basically... Putin's tiny little head, and I say tiny because his strategic capability, I think, has always been limited. I think he was been a tactical opportunist, not a statistician. But it, what he was thinking, because he was fed the information the Ukrainians would flop sides, that his little advance, imagine what Putin's imagination looked like, that, you know, Ukraine would capitulate, it would become part of greater Russia. And now he would add Ukraine's resources to Russia, which are not insignificant. It's about a third of the population again. He's also pushed back traditionally the boundaries to the mountains, which sit on the edge of the western edge of Ukraine. Now all he's got to deal with is Belarus's alliance. And now he's got to push back into the central part. And suddenly he's got all the way back to this gap, which sits just below Denmark, which traditionally has been the, the plains that made Russia vulnerable. And so you can see himself migrating his way across. The West was weak. His armies were all beating and everyone wanted to embrace him. That was his vision of leadership. And 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 the problem with it is it's, it, he A, didn't understand what, it, he's not a military man. I mean, much as the interesting Hitler was a corporal who fought, he knew what war looked like. And when you look at the opening stages of his gambits, they were really quite inspired. His, all his generals said, you can't do that, it won't work. He had inspiration right the way up to the failures in Stalingrad. And his biggest mistake was not taking Moscow, instead going for the oil fields. And that failed to give the, the German army the, the ability to billet in the winter and go through the next level. He that was his From that point onwards, he never made a, a, a good decision. But up until he made a sequence of them, Putin's military understanding is zip zero. Zero, as you can see that. And he even had his intelligence services formulate the line of march for the columns that invaded designed to deceive the west by not putting the fighting units at the front and putting the cooks at the front metaphorically and in fact the western intelligence saw them forming up and said that's not an invasion force that's something else so the deception was good because we didn't see it in the short term the deception was bad because the ukrainians resisted and the combat units were at the back of the column and it just got worse and from that point onwards every he is lost he lost from the moment he couldn't get into Kiev. And any smart person would have said, let's just stop right now because this doesn't end well. But he hasn't. And he's grinding his country into dust. And he reminds me an awful lot of the German high command in 1917 and 1918. And in the end, all they were fighting for was some kind of negotiated settlement rather than total surrender. But does he not stand to gain potentially twofold? One, because I happen to think anyone in his position doesn't want to be a number two to, a, to a, a potential big brother over the corner, which is China. I can't see China sort of sitting in a 50-50 partnership with Russia. Russia no. would, uh, and the second thing, the longer that he can maintain the war effort uh, and the longer he could just stand there and watch the Western world tear itself apart on a social and political scale, he also holds a great deal of power because of his ability to control and turn off if he wants to gas supplies does that does that not work in his favor no nothing works in his favor right now his revenues have been curtailed 
with some really clever oil mechanisms. So his revenues are being curtailed, his people are being killed, the trust in his leadership is collapsing. Every part of this is not a, a, an attritional war that favours him. And he's lost his armoured capability, he hasn't solved the fighting capability, and he's watched the Ukrainians become more and more effective and receive the best possible weapons to rip him open with a can opener. He is looking very uncomfortable. Even, even a man who didn't appreciate the military construct now must realise there's no way out. But what he'll do is he will wait and wait and he'll watch his forces collapse. And I think, so I don't think there's any part of this that that suits him or he could have orchestrated. I don't think the West, the West is slightly different in that we should have literally, our, our errors are just so numerous. I mean, I would have put a, a no-fly zone over the whole of Ukraine, said, sorry, game over, not part of NATO. You bring your forces in here. Our NATO air forces will rip you to bits. Could have done that so easily. Didn't do that because Biden's a chicken shit. But that should have happened very early on when we realized it was a dead cert. He wasn't playing. The moment he met Biden in Switzerland and he asked for things that Biden couldn't give, there was a reason for that because he didn't expect them to be given. He knew they were going to be given because he was going anyway. The moment that happened, we should have put that in. The moment the invasion took place, we should have mobilized as a NATO force the resources we've now given them instead of feeding them in piecemeal, except, and I will give this to the, if you are the commander of NATO forces, and and you, I was very ardent about this, is part of Putin's vision for success was his nuclear policy of escalating to de-escalate. As in, I take your land, and then I drop a nuclear warhead on your head and say any more of that, and I'll drop another one, and I'll keep it, because you're chicken out. And there's a lot of argument to think that that's probably how we would have responded. And slowly we watched him blackmail and you had, you know, Pavlov's dog's behaviours by Biden saying, don't want to start the war, don't want to start the Third World War. And that gave him the space to run riot. And as I described it, the strategy is appropriate, is boiling the frog gently. And we have boiled the frog gently to the point where he's now cooked and can't get out. But we had to break that linkage between single nuclear use and that was where the Nord Stream strike came in. I think there was a nuclear dialogue, which was one of, obviously, the offensive was working in the south and the north. Putin was on the chocks. He was close to really using a nuclear weapon. Finally, the Americans woke up and said, if you do that, we'll use a massive conventional strike. And your only counterpart is a full nuclear engagement. Do you want to do that? And Putin then deployed this strategy he's been building, which is subsea attacks because it's much bigger than the Nord Stream, and said, well, if you do that, I'm going to start cutting off your pipelines because I've developed an undersea speciality. And why do I think that's real? Why do I not think the Germans did it, or the Ukrainians did it, or the Americans did it? It's because if you look at the logs of submarines transiting in and out of fast lane, the intense activity that followed afterwards suggested NATO was having a shit fit because it was a real threat. They'd underestimated it, and they didn't know what else would go up. So it was part of the strategic dialogue that raised the nuclear ceiling and has subsequently allowed the Western NATO powers to commit to, NATO, to, to Ukraine's success by giving weapons. And always Britain has led the charge. I really got to give us credit that if it wasn't for Britain, none of this would be happening because we've cleverly offered a tank which led to leopards. You know, the, the American um, tanks basically would never turn up because it'll take them a year to take the depleted uranium off. Britain has led the charge and played a role which I predicted as an expanding system to fill the American gap. And we are Putin's nemesis in that regard, along with Zelensky and his country's uh, real courage. We've dragged everyone with us. So I've got two questions then, which almost come as two parties in their own element. Sorry to throw so many questions at you. So the, first, here for. So the first is, in terms of an outcome then, with regards to Putin and Ukraine, what happens there? And then the second part of that question is going back to the start of this entire conversation, relating it to what people are experiencing in the everyday. If, based on that outcome, what happens to things like natural resources, food production, the more uh, availability of things, the cost of living and so forth. And then the second thing which we'll come to probably next is that's the Russian element or the Russia, the war for Ukraine. The big elephant in the room which would remain thereafter and it also would be a big driver with regards to inflation and potentially ongoing of world war three would be china but if we go back to that russia 
So, so, I mean, right now, I think you're seeing the offensive has really started. It's in the shaping phase. And things, for example, you know, like the sabotage of trains, the incursion towards Belgrade, um, the use of storm shadows, which was only announced two days beforehand, not just storm shadows, <clears throat> but the Americans gave these drones called mauls, which basically fly in swarms around them, <clears throat> defeat the air defense and make sure the primary system gets in. All of those things suggest to me it started already in terms of putting the Russian forces on you know, tender hooks, we won't be hearing about the plethora of other things that are happening. And somewhere in this moment, somewhere, anytime, we will hear about artillery barrages that were like the ones around Bakhmut on the flanks only a couple of weeks ago that forced the Russians back, even though they lost the city on the flanks, they forced them back. And suddenly the Ukrainians manifested a very powerful artillery barrage, which shocked the Russians. When we see these large barrages taking place, it's basically because the Ukrainians feel their moment has come and they will advance between two and three axes. And once that happens, I think the chances of the Russians stopping them are zilch. Literally, the chances of a Russian folding are very high. And that's not to say there won't be casualties and fighting as the Ukrainians break through this 50 mile crust of defenses. But in truth, the systems they have, those defenses are not really going to last very long. They're far more to keep the hands busy digging holes than their effectiveness. And there is no strategic reserve in terms of the Russian army to plug the holes. And if there's a proper air defense capability, you know, in terms of forward based patriots, long range domes of defense, there's no way the glide bombs are going to interdict the, the areas and the net net will be quite stunning as it was. If you go back and look at the early the Gulf War battles where modern forces faced Soviet forces and ripped them apart in ways we couldn't imagine, I think the parallels are very similar. So <clears throat> where does that lead us to? Leads us to the conclusion that if the Chinese had thought they had to intervene, they would have done already because this is going to happen very quickly when it happens. And the Chinese appreciate that. Their, I think their strategic appraisal will be no different from mine. So they've accepted that Putin is going to get ejected from Ukraine. And they must have accepted that his replacement will be a hardline Russia, in which case Russia is going to retreat behind its borders and it's going to reconsolidate itself and rebuild. And it's going to reconsolidate with China its alliance. And that's kind of how I see it. Now, there might well be in the in the throes of Putin's last time, the use of Nord Stream type strikes against British targets. There is no doubt that Britain is number one target for revenge. That means we lose communications cables or with a few gas line pipes something is something i can see him not going without a twitch so and i'm not sure we blocked that one off we don't know whether some of them are mined or not there's enough of them we don't have the resources to check so that wouldn't surprise me you know it could be something like you lose transatlantic cabling because the belgrod funny enough their strategic operations submarine has a thing called a loan shot which can go to the bottom of the atlantic and cut cables now that's more easily monitored so we'll know whether it happens or not. But nonetheless, I think that process is pretty much just a matter of when. Okay. So, so when do the Chi when do the Chinese move? This is your next question. And the Chinese criteria are as follows. They, like the Germans in March 1936, started the four-year plan, which was to militarize their society, stockpile resources, and basically be bankrupt by 1940 or go to war. Go to war being how you get the treasure and payback for all your investment. They went to war. If Chamberlain had even understood that, phrases like peace in our time would have meant nothing. Because when you're facing a country that's going to be bankrupt or go to war, they go to war. So that's China. China initiated the same program at the onset of the pandemic. That's March 2020. So, And it's not a four-year plan. It's probably even quicker. So the financial distress China is in, Coupled with another mechanism, which is just as I talk about individuals have social camouflage, destructive individuals use social camouflage to let normal people think they're normal and then they do their damage. That's exactly what the Chinese did. They built a free market system because it made the West think that they were the same. That free market system is no longer needed. The camouflage has been discarded and there is a mass evacuation of capital where possible and their markets are kind of in decline. So the process means that they don't have a lot of time before she's in trouble for the economy. Let's just give them a year. Let's be optimistic. But they have another window, 
And that window is essentially, I've developed these hypersonic weapons. We believe that 50 of them kill a carrier group escorted by three Ali Burke destroyers, maybe two destroyers and a Trichondra cruiser. I load 50 missiles and it saturates the defense system. I kill the carrier. Okay, so let's say the Americans are really smart and they go and put nine defense ships. So, okay, now it's 150. Don't worry, I've got 1,200. I've got enough to kill every carrier group and defense like assault new group for the Marines and get rid of all the bases at the same time. So what happens if the Americans learn how to intercept hypersonic glide weapons that weave at high speed? So when you look at the success of the Patriot with the Kinzor system, although it is really an iteration of the same capability now on warships with Aegeus, with a ballistic missile defense system, it's SM-3 and SM-6 missiles, obviously they transposed it, it's still a reminder that a weapon that a year ago was considered to be invulnerable, essentially, is now a weapon which can be shot down. That's, don't worry, that's a, that's a reminder that essentially from that process, how much longer does China have before its invulnerable window to operate disappears? And rest assured, the Americans are not idle. They will be busting their chumps to find ways of countering these weapons, shoot down the satellites, do every, whatever they can in terms of the net that targets them to try and prevent their ships being hit. You also so, mentioned you also mentioned about the coalition between Russia and China earlier and how paramount that is for China to maintain those supply lines that Americans can't hit. Because if you go and look at the Pacific War, which is a very good model for, I think, what this next conflict looks like, you had this surprise attack by Japan, you had this consolidation of the region, and China, China, Japan's problem is it was only like semi-industrialized. It was mostly rural, and it never really had industrial capacity to ever meet America, as Yamamoto knew the mistake they'd made. But China does, and China can infuse and indoctrinate South Korea, for example, which I'm afraid I don't think will survive the North Koreans at the same time. And in all of those countries, infuse gives an industrial power base to die for. But you need to feed it with resources to build warships, to build the biggest navy the world's ever seen, to come out five years later and do the second phase of this conflict, which is take the world. So I don't think this is an immediate process. This is a 10-year, if you're China, it's like a massive multi, it's a decade-long project to dominate the world. So it'll come in phases. So from a war perspective, we fully expect Russia to be defeated in the Battle of Ukraine. Uh, although we do not expect that to have any implications for the political or commercial relationship between Russia and China. We expect China to continue with its acceleration in this race for arms that it's equipping itself with akin to basically the Germans prior to World War II. And unfortunately, it would appear at some point within the next decade that uh, China is going to launch an offensive whether it's surprise or whether it is gradual or however well, that's going to pan out. I think that you need to phrase that within the next year. Within the next year. It's imminent. The, 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 the parameters around an economy which has gone to a wartime footing that goes tits up and essentially this window for the use of hypersonic weapons, within two years you've got to think the US Navy's developed powerful lasers, which is going to be an incredible defensive capability. So... They don't have long, they're windows now, which is if you listen to, and it's not in our press, but when you go to the Murray Nations, you look at the March speeches made by Xi, they are the most belligerent things you've ever heard. They remind me of Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, but they weren't reported in our press. If you listen and you read what he said, this man is rattling his saber for action. And I find that very sobering. So we're effectively going from one conflict to the next. But on a global scale, Probably well, they're really, scale. yeah, they're linked. Well, I believe we're already in World War Three. We just haven't worked it out. Um, and you could argue that you know Czechoslovakia and buying Czechoslovakia, giving Czechoslovakia away, was World War Two started before you know it, as we know that really it started in the Manchurian Peninsula when Japan went in there. All of the things that were happening. War is like a disease. Once it starts, it becomes socially acceptable to keep going. So where it starts is where the war starts. And it's to do with this entropic cycle, which I describe the, the Kondratiev cycle as an entropic cycle, that war becomes acceptable to overturn the order of things. We're already in it. But the problem is, and this is very interesting, where does delusion come in? And so there was denial and delusion 
in Britain and France right the way up to the day the first shot was fired. And you look at it and you think, how could you do that? Why? Because most people can't comprehend the aggressive actions of a leader when they're not aggressive themselves. Total delusion. Not the same in the Second World War, because a whole generation had seen the reality of war, seen the characters of war. So you do not see the same denial. You see the denial in Chamberlain, who tried to stop it through appeasement, but that wasn't the same shock. There was just an acceptance amongst many other people. It was inevitable. Our paradigm is very like 1914 and the pre-moments of total missing the point of what our enemies plan for us. And one of the problems is that China has bought so many of our Western politicians off. Boris's family were bought off. There's issues about Biden's son and his deals with the Chinese. They made sure that money changed outcomes and they've silenced responses. In this country, our treasury still thinks it can have a commercial relationship with China. And so instead of calling China a threat in our strategic you know, repeat or renewal contract, it's just a challenge for a decade. Right? We can't mince our words anymore. And we have to realize that what goes on in the Asian basin comes back to us because rest assured, the moment China goes and take that region, they will take the excess of troops in North Korea that they have and they will send them to the Eastern Front. And China, Russia will come back reinforced by its allies. And we will end up engaged in an Eastern Front conflict. So it isn't just going to leave us alone. So we are, unfortunately, um, already in the midst, but we are effectively staring down the, uh, down the barrel of a heightened global conflict, which is going to be... Uh, it's, it's, it's got all the hallmarks of uh, a long and incredibly difficult battle, really. I don't and, know how to phrase and, it. And one that the psychology of our nations as soft, hubristic Westerners is not well suited to be fighting. The Ukrainians fundamentally far tougher than the West, and that's why they've adapted well. We are not and not prepared for this. We don't have a sense of collective duty that suffuses the Chinese force structure. We actually have a, a collective duty to ourselves in our own minds, not the nation state. So we are soft and exposed and we've been infiltrated. I mean, you know, you look at what happened at the beginning of the Second World War when Japan in America, all the Japanese had to be interned. The Italians were interned. So a friend of mine told me today, all the Italians were interned in the UK in the Second World War. So we're going to end up with a process whereby we're, how do you expunge this infiltration all the way across our society before we can even get the walls up to defend ourselves? We have some very big challenges very big bigger than any nation i've seen in history in the last 120 years of war what does it mean economically so bringing it to the second part of that question i asked so at the moment of course resources cost of living everything's almost means, out of control that's going to continue it means, it means yeah it means initially a massive hit to our economy and the migration from a free market economy to essentially some hybrid version of a command economy that suborns all of the resources of the economy into a defense structure that, that supports the protection of our societies. Effectively so, back to World War II scenario, where a high proportion of GDP goes into the defense. Exactly right. And and that means that, you know, making flowery little pink umbrellas may not be have a future to it as, you know, making some aspect of a weapon system or little drones that can hunt out other drones. So, you know, we're, if you look at the Ukrainian economy, look at how it's evolved to a wartime economy and expect we're well, going to have to mirror the same thing. And so the free market system is going to change and pensions are going to suffer because they're all locked in with this idea that basically it'll be there for you. Well, our financial system is going to take a major shaking. You know, one thing you know is to fund your war effort, you issue bonds like crazy. So bond and interest rates go up as a result of that. And the net process as it goes up is essentially you have inflationary dynamics. Everything costs more. So we, we end up, we have some serious challenges ahead and we've squandered all of the good things we had. And our war chest is, is a part, our war chest has some qualities. The adaptiveness of our weapons is impressive. Our technology is impressive in Europe and America. And the trick is to have the industrial base to create solutions. I don't think this is a foregone conclusion, as in we haven't lost, but man, we put ourselves right to the wire 
in terms of how we recover from the first hits and adapt. And I keep thinking about Britain. And we always remember how we won and D-Day and, you know, al Alamein and the successes running up through Italy. What we forget is what it was like from 39 to 42, where literally we had the crap beaten out of us. And even Churchill looked like he was an incompetent war leader and came under question because we just couldn't find a victory as we fought an organisation and nation that had prepared for war, had a war mindset and then ran us over. So I think it doesn't go immediately to, oh, we took it on the chin and we recovered and it was OK. This is going to be deeply soul searching and, you know, actually preventing capitulation is going to be a problem as, you know, the dynamic between Churchill and Halifax after Norway and around the Dunkirk period, we're going to see a lot of that. And I hope Zelensky is mirrored in our societies, a hero not yet seen or estimated that finds its way to the top. Geopolitically, where do other regions sit in all of this? The Middle East, Africa, places like that, Australia. How uh, does the global okay. landscape look? Okay, so Australia is, is, we should be watching Australia really carefully. Because one of the things, uh, and there's a whole marination on Australia coming up, and it's huge defence shift, which it's now making, is that when you see a hegemony rise, and you're a long way from that new rising hegemony, instead of sitting there thinking, it's thousands of miles from me and not my problem, you should be looking at what the neighbours are doing. So look at what Poland's doing compared to Russia. It's spending a fortune to build the biggest army in Europe. Well, that suggests there's a serious threat out there. So what are you doing, Britain, a few hundred miles back with long-range weapons? Oh, leaving it up to Poland. Does that make sense? The Australians similarly are reconfiguring the defence of Australia in a rerun of the Battle of the Coral Sea dynamic and Papua New Guinea to a forward defence with bases in the north, long range missile systems, even moving them forward. You've seen America make a pact with Papua New Guinea, seeing the Solomon Islands go to the Chinese because that chain of islands is just as strategic. And if America assumes it has lost the Asian basin, and I'm afraid that smart forward planners have to, then where does it break the fight back from? Well, in the Second World War, Britain was the huge aircraft carrier to fight back from. Australia is the equivalent, and it's getting real about the threat, which is very real. What about the Middle East? Well, the Middle East is full of dictators. And I think if you go and look at the voters that fell in line with raising oil prices, who were all dictators, it's rather concerning. And most of their their market base doesesn't go to America anymore because America is an independent oil producer. It goes to China. So I think we can assume that there's a bit of a problem there. And at the same time, you can see this sort of peace between Iran and, and, and Saudi Arabia is concerning. And the Iranians are very close to a nuclear breakout. The recent report suggests their enrichment is up to 86%, which means they're a step away. So, so we have got a big problem. And if you think about how North Korea went nuclear, it did it when America was looking in the Middle East and looking at you know Iraq. And so you can assume that something, anything that distracts America in the Asian basin is the moment that we you have to fear the Iranians move. And the Israelis don't have B2s to drop, you know, Moabs with deep penetrating capability. So there's a concern about that dynamic. And I think it's yet another touch point where with the hegemony loses power, every challenger rises simultaneously. And you can assume there's a web of connective, connective conversations between North Korea and China because North Korea is a puppet of China. Iran is deeply linked to Russia and also the Chinese. They're, and they're all linked in terms of what they share. And one of my biggest concerns, and I think it's probably already happened, is the Chinese desperately need submarine technology because in that war of the future where they build a navy to control the sea lanes, their submarine technology is noisy and rickety beyond their air independent kilo class type submarines. And they need Russian nuclear technology to build SSNs. And the Yasin class submarine is almost as good as ours. And if they've shared that technology, which I fear they have because Putin's been desperate, if they've shared that technology, then the Chinese are going to start to roll out very sophisticated submarines en masse. And we're really in trouble. So the Middle East as long as they maintain some form of diplomacy with Iran, you fear would side with China. I do. And I fear that, you know, again, think of Israel as an isolated bastion of the Western Christian world. I feel that it's very vulnerable. Now, Turkey is the balancing power of that. And obviously the elections with Erdogan, they're so marginal. I'm afraid Erdogan's election strategies aren't very honest. So if it's sort of 49 and a half, 51 and a half, 
I'm afraid he could swing it. And that's concerning too, because Erdogan isn't really a friend of the West. He's only a friend of himself. If if Turkey could be brought back into the Western fold as a cornerstone of that of the alliance structure, things change a bit in terms of projection of power into the region. But at the moment, I think you've got to consider it sort of a little bit like Stalin was. You know, he was neutral, not interested, and the only thing that brought him in was aggression that came earlier than he thought of by Germany, which cascaded him in. So Erdogan would probably follow some pattern like that. It's really unfortunate because you see the stories of valor from Ukraine and it kind of fills you with hope that perhaps there's a light at the end of the tunnel. We might be able to return to an element of normality. And then that big fear that we've had about China for so long looks like it's imminently going to become a reality. It is a reality. In fact, the evidence is so overwhelming and you will find huge portions of it if your readers join Murray Nations and you really should. There's there's, there's also another area um, and that is we have thought campaigns and one of them, if you scroll down the front page, you can see how to confront China. You can see how to lateralize our societies because one of our problems is we're so linear, we're not adaptive. So you've got to become adaptive before you can adapt and make the right decisions to counter conflict and talks about what Britain should have done having left for Brexit. And we haven't done one of those things because it's been sabotaged by the linear remaining blob that basically have stopped. I mean, I love the phrase, hasn't Brexit been a failure? And I would turn around and say, yes, it's been a failure because not one policy associated with Brexit that brought adaptation and advantage has been enacted. In fact, the policies have been reversed with higher taxation, not lower taxation. I mean, it just it's an incredible sabotage. And for those of you that thought Brexit should work, I think from the evidence of my social systems, it was exactly the adaptive strategy that we needed to depart from a moribund and collapsing EU, whose percentage of global GDP shrinks every year considerably, whose number of adaptive creative solutions shrink every single year, to think about the world as a global paradigm as we have done before. But we need policies that take advantage of that. I mean, one advantage has been good is our relationship with Japan. It's a brilliant policy. People forget that we had a brilliant relationship with Japan from 1860 all the way through to the beginning of the 30s. They were a close alliance in the region. So we've just rebonded with that friendship. And that's a good one to have. But most of the policies that dynamize our economy have been literally sabotaged. And that is really sad because think what we've done with the limited evolution of post-Brexit, we've led a COVID response process faster than anyone else. And we've led the charge consistently in the defense of Ukraine. So, and that couldn't have happened if we didn't have that Brexit-minded independence. We'd have been part of a blob that didn't respond. So just imagine what we would do if we actually put our house in order with adaptive strategies that optimizes our outcomes. We could be a defining powerhouse, even more so than we are as America wanes and Europe wanes and lead, lead the old in the struggle against this autocratic challenge, which will destroy democracy ultimately, if they're successful. You t you've referred a few times to your Mara Nations. Uh, before, obviously, uh, talking off camera, you also said that there's a podcast which is uh, imminently going to come across us. Do you want to just uh, enlighten everyone about that? Yeah, um, well, the podcast is with my son, um, Winston, my oldest son. And uh, he came and said, why don't we do a podcast, Dad? And, you know, so that's a great idea. And he did everything. He called it the state of it, did the artwork, does the recording, asked questions, and then puts it up there. And it's been, you know, in the top 5% of podcasts in the country. It's been quiet for six months because Winston has been at Durham University studying somewhat harder than he could have imagined. And uh, it's all gone a bit quiet. But we're about to restart Series 2. And that's, I think, an interesting interchange, or people find it interesting, because it's a generational interchange between the father and son. So there's a generational perspective there which i think adds a different an interesting dimension and um he's a great interviewer and i'm really proud of the fact that he created something which i just answer a few questions on and who might he be named after uh he would be named after winston the drug dealer man from jamaica <laughs> as someone as so as someone said what are you naming your son and i said winston he said winston who the drug dealer from jamaica i was horrified so bloody winston churchill anyway my second son's named horatio Ooh. he's named after someone else at the famous that could be a few people there are a few horatios actually in history go on tell us which one so there's only well horatio as you know means timekeeper in latin and it's a roman name 
But the greatest Horatio has to be Horatio Nelson that secured the seas for the global maritime power of Britannia. Indeed. Uh, David, I can't thank you enough for coming on today. Um, I hope everyone watching and listening uh, is able to kind of digest what we've spoken about and that what we are being fed and what is and is not in the news, unfortunately, doesn't tell us the full truth. Um, I'd also put out that history shows that it isn't all doom and gloom and that we can be, we can take solace um, and comfort from Ukraine have shown the way. We see what the likes of Poland and Australia are doing um, in a preemptive manner of arming their defences. And we have a history as a nation when the going gets tough of finding a way to come together and pulling through. Um, unfortunately, it does appear that in the short term, the difficulty that we are all feeling in our pockets um, is going to continue. So I just implore people just to continue in a bloody-minded spirit that Brits are renowned for. Um, we've managed to get it so far, despite the best efforts of Russia and China. So we just continue in the same vein. Uh, David, I do hope that you'll come on again because there's so many other things that we need to talk about away from uh, the potential threat of China. We didn't even get on to any kind of subjects along the lines of Epstein or anything of that nature. So many prevalent things which have been in the news over the last 12 months and many other things as well, which really do spam society. So I do hope we can arrange another one of these a little bit sooner than it has been last time. It, 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 would, be, it would be my pleasure. And I will echo what you say. I know that the message that I have is hard to hear and for my journey um, I started talking about the, these models after 9-11 and certainly by 2005 had formulated everything that you hear and was speaking publicly and people kept saying to me you must write a book and I would arm and arm and say bit of a problem really because I'm so dyslexic can't really read what I wrote the previous day the next day. And then my twins came along, Horatio is one, and he has a, a, a sister called Madeline. And I was feeding them milk at one o'clock in the morning. And I had this incredible sense of, oh my God, what have I done? I brought my children into this world that I can see what it will look like. And I need to do something to explain to people what the confluence of these events mean is going to happen. And sadly to say, every single strand of what I talked about, and you can read Breaking the Code of History and more now than ever, the power of the models accurately predicted the past 20 years, so it's there for you. But the irony was the next day, I could write something that the following day I could actually read. And that was the beginning of this weird journey. And I'm not religious, I am deeply spiritual in our connection to the divine. But it was like the a parallel of the gift of the tongues. I suddenly had a skill I didn't have. Now it took me years to evolve it. I needed more editing at the beginning. But 20 years or so later, a little under, I write the way I write and I think simultaneously. My spell checker suffers rather grievously and groans a little bit, but nonetheless, and I've had to do that to communicate in the way that I felt helped the verbal word or whatever dimensions. So it, I say that because I never thought I'd be doing this. I had to develop skills to pass on the knowledge which I was given by my life's experience for our children and our well-being. And I sort of think if it sounds crazy, but if I can, as a dyslexic, create a written word and four books, man, all of you will have hidden talents. And it's those talents, funny enough, that hardship and conflict bring into ref bring into being within us. And it is a very strange reflection that wars bring out the worst and the best of humanity in our creativity. And right now, that's what we have to find in ourselves. Our ancestors have done it. As you quite said, we Britain has an incredibly proud tradition of it, and we need to mobilise that. And if we're lucky, we might just get deterrence in to stop it. And be, by being aware of the threat and turning to face it, we might just face it down. But we have to move quickly and we need to do it totally. And if, heaven sake, that doesn't work, we'll be better prepared against the initial struggles than our ancestors were in after 1939. And hopefully that will buy us time to, to make sure the outcome is the right one for us. I echo all of that. Again, thank you very much for joining me today. It's a great uh, pleasure, Ads. And uh, just for everyone else, again, please don't forget to like and subscribe. Please also, and I implore you to comment um, on this and all other videos as well, because David and I do read them. Um, and it is a source of, of great satisfaction to, to hear and read that you guys are enthralled with what we talk about today. And I will also include links in the description to David's website and to the Murray Nations. But until next time...
Uh, thank you for watching. Again, hit the like and subscribe buttons. See you again soon.